Hello everyone, I'm James Milan. Welcome to this episode of Talk of the Town. Um, this is another unusual episode of Talk of the Town, I have to say, because it's gonna be a little bit of a combination of two series that we do. Talk of the Town, as I already mentioned. Another series that we have here at ACMI is called Million Dollar Gift, and it really seeks to kind of draw some attention to the incredible bounty uh, that we all get in the community of Arlington from the volunteerism of lots and lots of people in our, in our town who are doing, uh, giving of themselves in ways that the rest of us, are, that is invis are invisible to the rest of us and we are enjoying the benefits of those on a daily basis. This is an example of that and it also is a companion piece to an interview that I did with a couple of guests from El Salvador recently. Um, and I will explain further, or the conversation will kind of elucidate as we go along, uh, that conversation that I had with our Salvadoran guests as well, who were uh, Zulma and Lorena were their names, and you will be seeing them in another portion, in another portion of this program. Um, but I want to welcome my guests, Thank and you. thanks for your patience as I was going on and on. Um, they are Elizabeth Dre, right mm -hmm. here, and Beth Soldsberg. Um, Elizabeth and Beth, Together, uh, I don't know, should I say run? Run the... Together, but with a group of other volunteers. Of course, right. of course. Well, yes. and everybody runs it. Right. It's a democracy. Yes. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it is uh, the Arlington Teosinte Sister City Project that we are here to talk about, and that is what uh, my two guests are very heavily involved in. So first of all, thank you both for being here. We really do appreciate it. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you so much yeah. for Always. this opportunity. Yeah, and I really, I was saying that there are elements of this conversation that really have to do with the million dollar gift because I'm looking at two very busy women. I know that. <laughs> I absolutely know that, and yet you have carved out the time in your schedules to, um, and I imagine it's a considerable amount of time to be doing what you're doing with the Sister City Project as well. Um, so I want to start by just asking you, okay, so why? Why this? Mm -hmm. uh, what is your own personal journey and then connection to this particular issue? Either one of you. I'm gonna let Beth go first. Okay. I'll, I'll start. Um, so I got involved with U.S. El Salvador Sister Cities when I was in college. I was at the University of Wisconsin Madison, and Madison actually has a sister village in El Salvador called Arcatau, which is not very far from Teosinte. And uh, this was when the Civil War was taking place in El Salvador, which was from 1980 until 1992. And um, I was very interested in understanding more about the U.S. role in Central America and liked the idea of the sister city model, that it was really a people-to-people -people kind of entity. And so I went to El Salvador twice during the Civil War as part of the Madison Architao Sister City Project. And I actually went to Teosinte as well as a number of other villages in that area. And I saw things that completely changed my life. I saw people cooperating on a level I had never experienced in the United States. So these were people under incredible duress. Um, their lives were at risk every day. And there were um, agreements made by these communities like Teosinte on how everyone would share the limited amount of food they had. If there was a cow, they would prioritize children and older adults to get a share of the milk. There was to be no gambling, no drinking. If there were domestic issues, the elected town council would adjudicate it. They had systems in place to help them survive as a unit. And like so many people from the US who had that opportunity to spend time in villages like Teosinte in that era, we came back and we just felt like we had to bear witness to what we'd learned, um, particularly because the U.S. Um, government was funding and training mm -hmm. and arming the Salvadoran military, which committed the vast majority of human rights abuses during the war. So. All of that happened. I lived in different places, did different things for many years, moved to Arlington. And then I learned that Arlington was one of you know, a dozen US 
communities that had a sister village in El Salvador. Elizabeth and I were at Great Expectations Preschool over on Summer Street. Yep. As parents, yep. we both had two kids in preschool. And so we were hanging out on the playground there watching our kids, you know, run in circles and throw yeah. leaves at each other. <laughs> and um, we started talking about it. And yeah. Elizabeth also has a connection in Central America. And long in the short, we decided we needed to jump into the sister city group. And meanwhile, the volunteers who'd been running it for a long time were ready to pass the torch. Yeah. And so we, we took it on and kind of because of where we were in life, we wound up pursuing a school curriculum right. that has become one of the important parts of what the sister city group does. Yeah. And Elizabeth has been really managing it and directing it for many years now. So let me pass it on yeah. to you. <laughs> I, I think my experience was a little more um, maybe your typical North American who really had no idea about what our government had done in El Salvador. And my initial um, attraction to it was the cultural opportunity that it offered me and my children to sort of um, make a connection with a village and children their own age uh, living a very different life than they were living. We were um, speaking Spanish at home and there was, you know, I was immediately drawn to that connection also. Uh, it wasn't really until we went down in 2013. No, our first trip. Oh, our five, first trip. 2007? 2008. Um, that I really fell in love with it, that I really felt that connection that Beth felt when she went down. It was pretty abstract for me. Mm -hmm. The people were pretty abstract. The idea was pretty abstract. Um, but once I went there and um, was welcomed, was welcomed like a long lost family member, um, was able to sort of just sit at the table and sit next to people and hear their stories, um, really, I felt like it was such a blessing that they trusted me with their stories and that they would tell me um, what what their experiences were, their losses were, what their hopes were. And I was just really overwhelmed, <laughs> to be honest. Um, the sacrifices that these people had made uh, of family members and children and parents and yet they, the hope that they had, the complete dedication that they had to making it better for the next generation. Um, and not only the hope, but the skills, the community organizing, the strength, the experience, the knowledge to, to make it happen. Um, I was, took me, it took me a while to really process all that. And then I've never looked back. You know, I think it really was the people to, the person to person connection that I was able to make and that you made when you went down there that keeps us involved. It's been 15, 17 years since it's been we started. Since 2005. Okay, yeah. Yeah, whatever so, that is. Yeah, yeah that's been a lot of years. years. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, no, we're, that is a serious commitment. Yeah. And I know that you really do invest an awful lot of your time um, yeah. with this. And uh, clearly, it, 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 the way that you spoke about it just now, very clear that that impact has yeah. not diminished, at, that first impact from 2005 hasn't diminished at all. Right. Yeah, or 2008, sorry. Wh whenever, yeah. yeah. And we also took our, um, we, when we left our, the first time, we, we said to each other, wouldn't it be great if we could come back with our kids? Like we really wanted our kids to have that experience of being in the village and swimming in the river and running through the soccer fields and just that, that to make their own connections, right? And we were able to do that. We brought our families back in 2013. Um, and that's also an experience that has, com you know, completely, that's a connection they've made. And now they are connected, not only with Teosinti, but also with that greater region mm -hmm. and an understanding of the history of the United States and what we, our government did in, in, in El Salvador. So that's also been really important to us. Well, I have to tell you both that um, one thing you wouldn't know about me um, is that I, uh, I was a high school teacher for many years, and one of the courses I taught was Latin American history mm. uh, because I also I grew up outside the country. I lived in uh, Nicaragua as a, mm. as a young person um, and have always felt a connection yeah. for those same reasons. I also, on a sabbatical year, brought my own 
we, we, we brought our kids to Mexico to live for a yeah, year wonderful. and it has had a tremendous uh, impact throughout their lives. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something around which I really do yeah. connect in a very personal way to what you're saying. The other thing is that I have been speaking for many, many years with people about what the U.S. Mm. U.S. relations with Latin America going back for our entire histories. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a sordid uh, picture mm -hmm. on the whole. And uh, life in the 1980s in El Salvador was absolutely hellish. And for you to have experienced what yeah. you did in going down there, and you just explained it so well, um, it really does speak to uh, just like, oh my God, talk about resilience, right, of the human spirit. and the fact that people would come together uh, rather than fight over resources, you know? Yeah. It's, the, it's that come, you know, the communitarian approach to life instead of the, you know, I'm gonna take mine. Right. Um, and we can never be, get tired of hearing stories that reinforce mm -hmm. that idea, nor can we ever turn our backs, I hope. Right. Um, on people who demonstrate that they're capable of doing that. So, uh, you know, I just want to say I appreciate and I admire the work that you guys are doing, and I thank you for it, um, both personally and as, a, as, as, as yeah. a resident here in Arlington. It really is. It's a great thing. So let's talk about it yeah. uh, a little bit more. Let's talk about, I mean, people may have heard um, for in, in different ways about the existence of this program, um, but I bet most folks in, living in Arlington, even for a long time, don't really know, okay, so what does that mean? Yeah. Um, so let, let, let's just start with what does a sister city, what are the elements that uh, go into a relationship which is a sister city relationship? Mm -hmm. Well, this particular relationship was established in 1988, which is the same year that refugees returned from camps in Honduras where they had been sheltering and went back to El Salvador with the war continuing and resettled Teosinte. So at that time, there were people in Arlington who wanted to partner and provide moral support and material support and other kinds of assistance. So during those first few years, that was a lot of what it was about. And um, so the sister city efforts included trips that folks from Arlington made to Teosinte, bringing school supplies and medicine. And then also when someone from the village was captured and detained to call members of Congress and lobby on their behalf, things like that. But since the peace was signed in 1992 and things changed, uh, the sister city relationship has evolved. Um, and it's become much more about education, cultural exchange, but it's always centered around this idea of accompaniment. Mm -hmm. So we're very clear that it's not a charity. And I think that was one of the things that really drew me to the sister city work and kept me is this idea of accompaniment, that we are, we are there together as equals. Yeah. And we really learn and gain as much from them as, as we give back. Um, and there are some specific activities that we do. Do you want to talk about those? Um, regarding the schools or? The schools and crafts and yeah. scholarships. Um, so to piggyback on what Beth said, I think also what's really important is that it is a mutual you know, solidarity, um, that we both um, respect each other's communities and what it is that each, each community knows what they need, mm -hmm. right? It is not for us to tell them what they need, or them to tell us. So um, it's been, it, one of the wonderful things is that, um, and, and made it fit so nicely with Arlington, is that the education is one of the priorities of, in, in the village. Um, and so we raise money, uh, we raise money through donations, we raise money um, through selling crafts that are made in the village. So the women, there's a sewing cooperative and the women sew the crafts. We bring them back in suitcases whenever people travel. I think you have an example, yeah. right? Let's, let's definitely <laughs> show people because that is awesome. Yeah, you can you can be the, the demonstrator. Um, <laughs> they, so, are, they really are beautiful. They're beautiful, indestructible. You yes. can machine wash them. Machine they, wash last they last forever. <laughs> so the um, the material is hand woven by a women's sewing cooperative in Guatemala. Um, and then the women in Teosinte, we ask them to make certain products. They make them. 
Um, we get them here and then we sell them mm -hmm. um, in house in house parties. So if anybody out there wants to host a house party, you can get in touch with us. Um, but that's really how we do it. We wouldn't, and the, let's see, we send 100% of what we make back to the village and they can do whatever they want with it. Mm -hmm. What they have cho chosen to do with it historically is use it for education. So high school, um, is not free and clearly college is not free. Uh, it's mostly subsistence farmers who do not have um, extra money to send their kids to school. So w with this money, we are able to provide scholarships um, that unfortunately don't pay everything. They really are a drop in the bucket, but they do allow sometimes some families to be able to send their, their children to high school, which is outside the village, or to go to college. Um, so, that's one of the things we do. The other uh, focus is, as Beth mentioned, on our curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, we've been really lucky to partner with, uh, with our Arlington Public Schools through their history department. We um, piloted a program at Brackett, which Beth was, was part of the initiative, the initial pilot in Brackett in the fourth grade. Um, we spent many years um, teaching the fourth graders about Teosinte. Um, now we're in the second grade. Um, but we also have touch points with the kids all through um, through high school, through the Spanish or the World Language Department. So um, the Spanish language teachers in the school system have been really generous with their time. And um, sometimes it's the Spanish club that we come and talk to. Um, we go into the classrooms. Um, we bring the speakers like Lorena mm -hmm. and Zulma. Um, I believe right before they spoke to you, they had spoken to about 400 high school students. Um, so that and I just want to I just want to throw in that you know in that conversation they both were clearly uh, moved and mighty impressed yeah. by just how much knowledge those students that they were in contact with already had yeah. about where they came from and you know what the conditions were like and what the history was like etc. So clearly your work is is uh, is 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 having an effect and uh, and I was also. I am a little surprised now that I think back on it to hear how surprised Lorena was to find that out because yeah. sh she must have known this is this is what you guys have been up to among other things. Yeah, yes. th she did know, but but she doesn't. You know, oh, that's right. she's, she's in charge of C space right. as a as a unit, so she's You're right. a, you know, so she does not really in it the wasn't a nitty direct gritty of the, the, right, yeah. of course. Yeah, right. she's a, in charge of um, an organization called Cripes, which is the Salvadoran counterpart to U.S. El Salvador sister cities that we are a chapter of. So, mm -hmm. and I think just experiencing it firsthand is something different. And yeah. I, I think one of my favorite things, and this is probably true for you, is when we have a booth at Town Day or something like uh, that, yep. and a high school student comes up to us and says, oh, I learned about yeah. that in second grade or fourth grade. And we will get inquiries occasionally from students who want to do internships with yeah. us, and they'll tell us, you know, I never forgot when we took that imaginary trip yeah. to Teosinte in my classroom. Or we and, ate pupusas. Right. We ate. You brought the food. Mm -hmm. We wrote letters. They, they, they remembered. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, uh, I can't but help. I can't help but mention the fact that you and I have um, a a uh, something that we 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 here at ACMI tried to help. Yes. Uh, with some of what you were just talking about, just yeah. uh, the that way of communicating what it was like to be here or there, and using the power of video as well. And in the end, we weren't able to. T completely yeah. successfully do that um, but it was it was uh, another example of the efforts that you're that you're describing here. yeah yeah and Arlington Educational Fund had oh, given right. that pilot grant to get this all started and so many teachers worked hard on it and at one point a group of teachers mm. spent a week in Teosinte um, and so many parents have been involved, so it's really been many hands involved in and making it work. I think it's a reflection, right, of the, of the Arlington community, of the teachers, mm -hmm. that they understood that this was something valuable and unique, and they really embraced it and, and elevated it and put their time into it. And we never could, you know, the board, the eight of us, six of us, you know, it's varied at times, we never could have done it without the warm embrace of the Arlington community. The parents. Um, every year, we would have a group of eight to ten volunteers at every elementary school who were there to put up bulletin boards, who were there to to like do the fiesta, to, like the enrichment, and to try to make it as the load as light as possible for the teachers, mm -hmm. um, so that they. And, but to add add to the to the curriculum, 
Um, so it's been great. Yeah, and I just want to uh, I want to kind of dig down a little deeper in something that you were just saying, Elizabeth, which is the priority on the Teosinte side of education, because mm -hmm. I was struck in the images that I remember seeing from the time that we were talking about in terms of our cooperative efforts, but even the images that are on your website now and that you've shared with us. Um, of the, the schools, the, the classroom, at the, or the, the school itself, which has three different classrooms, yeah. and we're talking about a community of 300, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, that's, as I, I believe you're, the video that accompanies says, that's smaller than your school, right? right? Yeah, talking, we, talking to the Arlington community. And, um, and but, the, but the, the school building itself, it's very order, it's, it looks like it's, very well maintained. Mm -hmm. Like like everybody in that community is making some kind of effort to make sure that place functions as best it can. Well, there's something really special about this school, and that's the teachers. So when they came back, the community was destroyed, and they they set to to building houses and you know um, picking the bombs out of the out of the fields and starting to cultivate again. But they also Net, they immediately focused on school and education. And um, the three teachers, who still are the teachers. I love this story. I love the story, ahead. right? <laughs> they were 13 or 14 <laughs> when they came back from the refugee um, camp in, in Honduras, and they were the ones who could read and write. And so at the age of 13, they became the teachers. And not only did they teach, but they also sheltered the kids because the war was still going on and soldiers were still harassing the village. So, you know, I, I can't imagine a 13-year-old not only teaching, but also sort of emotionally supporting students while there's a war going on. And they are still the teachers. They've gotten, gone back and gotten their licenses. Um, but I, I love that story. And I think one other thing that's reflective of how much education is valued is that the, the generation that resettled had about a third or fourth grade education. Mm -hmm. You know, that's because that's what life was. Also, you know, um, education wasn't prioritized. They needed to go out and work in the fields, and then the war came. So their children in one generation are graduating from high school and college and becoming professionals. And I just think that speaks to the incredible dedication that they have to ed an understanding like, of education is the key to the future. Abs yeah, mm -hmm. no, I, I, I think that that, that that is true, and I just want to reiterate what you mentioned earlier, which is that the school, the, the, all of the schooling that you can get within the town of Teosinte ends at a particular age, which is much earlier than yeah. any of us mm -hmm. have the expectation that our children or we will be done with school, right? And so then they have to figure out how to go on from there. And yet, as you have just cited, high school graduates and college yeah. graduates uh, if they don't abound, they are getting more and more yeah. plentiful there. That is remarkable. Yeah, it is. And it's good for individuals and families, but it's good for the community and the whole country. And that's how mm -hmm. people view it, mm -hmm. is this is also a way that young people who grew up in a very democratic community, and that's, that's what I have to emphasize about a place like Teosinte, it is so small d democratic, you know, that it's decisions are made by an elected town council. They're very dedicated to making sure there's representation from women as well as men, from people of different ages, young people, older people. Um, and really, there's a sense of, you know, we're in it together. And so every time a young person is able to graduate high school, is able to graduate college, that's someone who is shaping a better El Salvador, who carries with them this legacy of growing up in a community like that. And an example of somebody like that is Zulma, mm -hmm. who grew up in Sinqueda, which is another similar community to Teosinte. Right. And so she brings with her the richness of that experience to really demonstrate that it's possible for people yeah. to work together like that. Yeah, and for those who tune into uh, the conversation that will follow between uh, Zulma and Lorena and myself, they will see that Zulma is a mighty impressive person yes. considering yes, yes. how much translating she was doing <laughs> yeah. while also responding to my questions. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, it was, you know, she, she really is a, a, a great example of what you're, what it is that you're talking about. You know, we have very little time left. I knew this was going to yeah. happen, right? <laughs> I mean, it's going to be an abrupt ending at some point, and I'm sorry about that because I'd love the conversation to continue. Let me ask you, though, um, one thing that we touched on in my conversation with Zulma and Lorena was 
the situation in El Salvador right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet they needed to be somewhat circumspect in what they had to say bec for obvious reasons, I yeah. think. They are return they are now back in El Salvador, I, I yes. imagine, mm -hmm. and and they have to, you know, be concerned. You so we don't have to we right. can speak more frankly here. Mm -hmm. What do you guys understand about what's going on in El Salvador now? The as you said, the war ended in ninety two. Mm. The war ended in '92. Yeah. However, um, you know, the, the, it's a my understanding pretty grim situation mm -hmm. in that country at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, what what can you tell us? Absolutely. So, when the war ended, there was a whole generation that grew up without education, carrying guns. Um, there was the ongoing legacy of colonialism and abject poverty and disenfranchisement for most of the population. So these are things that don't just go away. And um, there um, developed a very um, strong um, infrastructure of gangs. Um, and the, the main gangs actually started in Los Angeles, yeah. where um, Salvadoran Salvadorans who came to the U.S. were jailed and had to fend for themselves and there were other gangs and then they were deported and brought the gangs back to what was a very fertile environment for gangs to flourish. Um, so what has happened over time is the population naturally wants the threat of the gangs to be addressed and many administrations there have dealt with this with what they call the mano dura, mm -hmm. the hard yeah. hand. The current administration um, run by President Bukele um, is very intent on presenting this show of force and now El Salvador has become a site of mass incarceration, actually surpassing the United States as having more people incarcerated per capita than anywhere. They just, since March, have incarcerated 55,000 people. Yes, I would, in, sorry. In a country the size of Massachusetts, for me, perspective. Yeah, so maybe you can confirm. Uh, I said something in my in my conversation with, uh, with uh, Zulman and Lorena that I had read recently, which is part of Bukele, part, part of President Bukele's draconian, for sure, mm -hmm. approach to, to dealing with this, is that at this point, uh, if you are in an assembly of, assembly of three people, you are now vulnerable to being arrested yeah. for yes. that alone. Yes. Yeah. So there's no due process. People can be held for 15 days without charges. Clearly, people are being profiled. So based on their age, based on the community they live in, how they look, they're being caught up in these sweeps of people. And often their relatives can't even find them. So a lot of people have died in prisons. Um, there are certainly Salvadorans who like how Bukele's handling things, you know, so this is like many um, political leaders we see around the world right now, um, where there's kind of a populist, you could say dictatorship or certainly mm -hmm. authoritarian regime that has a lot of people support it and other people are suffering mightily. Human rights organizations are very, very concerned about what's happening in El Salvador. But did you, Elizabeth, do you want yeah, to? Yeah, I think that um, I, knowing the past, knowing the history, knowing how much in, in the people in Teosinte and all over El Salvador have sacrificed for the democracy, for the, you know, and to see it slipping away from them, they see it. They know, they've, they've seen the other side, right? I think that's, um, it's very upsetting. I mean, I guess that's an understatement, but um, I think it's important that we in the United States use the privilege that we have um, of being able to, to question authority, the quest to talk about it, um, that we use that and we contact our congressmen and women um, and we use our voice to help uh, let people know what's happening down there. Um, and and stand against it, as we did back during the Civil War, as the original people who started the Arlington Teosinti Sister City Project did back in the 80s, um, use their voice to, uh, and, and the privilege that we have to, um, to lift, lift them up. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I, I have to note the sad irony, and uh, as you were explaining it, Beth, the sad irony and the fact that uh, you know, with the gangs being deported, returned back to El Salvador as the springboard for the current situation. Again, it's another example of that sorry history of American roots mm. for Latin American misery. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it is, it, it's not the way I want to end this conversation, right. the note on which I want to end the conversation. And, and I, I think, uh, you know, we won't, um, we'll, we'll talk for another minute or two, but that needs to be said, I think, again, that we, we, we bear a collective responsibility yes, for an awful lot of what is going on there and uh, to turn our heads or backs to that uh, just feels, it is wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is wrong. Yes. Um, but <laughs> partly because I don't want to uh, end on that note, yeah. but also partly because I, I want to, you know, also ask you, um, what was your experience of having Zulma and Lorena here? How does that fit in to the Sister Cities program in general? I look forward to the, the tour that comes through every every two years. Oh, that, um, okay. So when, it's a regular? Yeah. Um, for me, uh, it is a moment to reconnect, it, to, to reground myself with the, the work. Um, because as you mentioned, when you started, like, we're very busy people and it's easy to sort of lose, lose that connection. Um, but when they come, uh, it grounds me, it inspires me to see them fighting so hard and putting really their lives at risk every day. Um, and then I get to reconnect with the students here and the teachers. And f so for me, it's this really um, wonderful experience. Kind of reinvigorating. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I agree completely. And yeah. I'll just add that I think um, it's really about listening. And we have so much to learn from Zulma and Lorena and their colleagues on every level. Um, certainly they're able to give us a picture of what's happening in El Salvador that we can't get from reading the news. Mm. And they also are able to model for us what it's like to, to um, keep their spirit alive, keep their spirit strong. And as you were saying, given the legacy, given the losses, it's, it could feel very crushing. For me, it gives me a lot of perspective because I find myself, you know, dispirited about how um, divided our country is, some of the things we're facing here. And it's just um, a real kind of um, renewal of perspective to talk with them and see that yeah. they haven't missed a beat. They're saying, okay, this is what we're dealing with now. How shall we deal with it? Yeah. So um, I learn a lot from them. Yeah. All right, so last thing, I sincerely hope that, uh, like, like for myself, a number of our audience members have listened to this conversation and are inspired themselves um, to join the work uh, that you guys are engaged in uh, to support th that work in some way. Yeah. So clearly they can buy one of these beautiful <laughs> uh, pieces here. Um, that's, that's, an easy, that's an easy ask, but uh, just, let us know how do people get involved um, if they are interested. Fantastic. Well, um, we have a website, which is arlingtonteosinte.org. Um, so you'll be able to learn a little more about our history, things we didn't get to talk to you about. And also, there are right there different ways that you can support us. There's a way to sign up for our e-newsletter, which comes out very infrequently. So we will not sp be spamming anybody. We don't have time. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, but that's also how you're going to learn about craft sales. Um, you'll learn about these kinds of tours. Every year, we do a community education event around immigration. Um, so that's really how you're going to stay in touch with us and get the most updated information. Um, I think we have an email. It's arlingtontosinte at gmail.com. These are our flyers. They're usually at Robbins. I haven't been recently to see if they're there, but I'll make sure that they are. Is it, Ar let me just ask, is it Arlington dash Teosinte, just so in case people are, uh, or is it just plain? It would just be no dash. No. Okay, just yep. Arlington All Teosinte. One All one yeah. word, yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, yeah, and people who are interested should just reach out to us and we'll talk to you about what 
yeah. what sparks that interest, right. and we'll find a, a way for you to contribute and be involved. Yeah, we don't want to sort of hunt people into what we need. We want to figure out what inspires people, what is their connection to this kind of work, and, and make that something that we can build on. Wonderful. Well, I really, I thanked you at the beginning. I thank you even more uh, after, after the chat, really, because yeah. uh, it's super important work that you're doing, but also great education you've just given our audience yeah. and me. Thank you so Wonderful. much for thank that. You, thank James. you so much. Appreciate yeah. it very so, much. So um, this conversation also with Beth Salzberg and with Elizabeth Dre um, is uh, part of a companion piece or part of a, uh, or is followed, I should say, by uh, the companion piece to it that we've uh, alluded to uh, a number of times today. Uh, my conversation again uh, with Lorena and with uh, Zulma um, from El Salvador, which follows. Uh, and so we're going to take a short break and you can come back and hear that conversation. This is Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time. Hello everyone. I'm James Milan. Welcome to a Talk of the Town like you have never seen or heard before. Um, we are lucky uh, today to be joined by a couple of guests who I will introduce in just a second. Um, they are two women from El Salvador who are here as part of the Sister Cities program that Arlington is part of with a city, a small city in El Salvador called Teosinte. You may have heard of it. If not, then uh, that's part of what we're here for today to explain uh, both the Sister Cities program and especially to get the insights of our two guests um, into a culture, a region uh, that we are woefully unfamiliar with here in the United States. So just get a kind of glimpse behind the, the scene uh, or behind the curtain into uh, current events in El Salvador. Um, touch on some historical events too, I'm sure. Um, but basically have a conversation uh, taking advantage of the visit of our two our two guests. So seated right next to me is Zulma Torbar. Um, so Zulma, welcome. Thank you. And right next to her is Lorena Araujo. And uh, Zulma and Lorena, as I said, each hold different positions um, that are related to the Sister Cities program. Um, and um, they are visiting Cambridge, which is also part of the Sister Cities program, as well as Arlington, um, in a, I have to say, a rather uh, whirlwind tour of uh, the eastern United States, which we'll hear about in a second. So, primero, quiero decir muchas gracias de estar aquí a los dos. Gracias por invitarnos. Sí, muchas gracias. Oh, the other thing I should mention, we're going to be speaking sometimes in Spanish, Zulma is going to be carrying a large part of the weight because Lorena does not speak that much English and so she will be expressing herself in Spanish. Zulma will be doing much of the translating. Um, and I also uh, speak Spanish so I will be jumping in where I can be helpful. Um, so bear with us because it will be well worth the conversation even if it's an unusual kind of back and forth uh, compared to what we usually have on Talk of the Town. So, empezando entonces con la primera pregunta. First question for our guests is just what is your, uh, how has your trip been so far? Um, where is this your first time, your fifth time here in this area? And what are your impressions? So if you want to explain to Lorena what I asked. Ajá, ¿cuáles son sus impresiones? Si esta es su primera visita, quinta visita, ¿cuáles son sus impresiones de la visita en la zona, en el área? Bueno, esta es una visita como por tercera vez, pero para mí siempre las visitas son muy buenas. Hace ya bastante tiempo que no venía y hoy he aprendido más, he compartido y me siento feliz de poder llegar y estar junto a estudiantes, a maestros, maestras y compartir un poco de nuestra cultura y de, y de nuestro quehacer. So this is my third visit here and uh, it has been a while since I haven't been here but once again I'm here and uh, in every visit I learned a lot. During this time I've been in meetings with students and teachers and I am learning as always. Great. 
And how about for you? How, how has it been? And are you a veteran of uh, these <laughs> tours of the United States? Well, or? I think this is my third. Yeah, I think this is my third time here. And same, I've been learning a lot. And it's always a great pl pleasure to learn and share and exchange the culture and learnings of uh, both realities here in Arlington in the US and also in uh, the reality of my communities or our, our country in El Salvador. So it is great. It has been a great experience. We have been here for two days um, sharing and learning a lot. So thanks for having us. Absolutely. So uh, I just want to ask about your experience in the schools um, because I know that that's where you're spending a good amount of your time. So entonces, en las escuelas y las visitas a las escuelas, ¿Cuáles han sido, uh, otra vez, sus impresiones de los estudiantes de aquí uh, en las clases de español que ustedes han visitado? So I'm asking just about their visits to Spanish, uh, Spanish classes in Cambridge and in Arlington. Bueno, es impresionante porque tienen clases de español. Eso es la primera cosa que a mí me, me gusta y me impresiona, de que a ellos les guste también. Y el que tienen maestras que están bien dispuestas a enseñarles, unos están más uh, adelantados, digamos, y otros están iniciando, pero tienen el interés. Uh -huh. Y siempre eso es muy importante, que sean bilingües, por lo menos para mí. Yeah, I, I am very impressed uh, because, first of all, they are learning Spanish and uh, they, they have classes in Spanish that are, they like it and they, there are teachers that are very committed to, to teach that and motivate them to, to do that. Um, yeah, and I think that that is very important to be bilingual. For me, it is very important. Yes, I'm wondering, ¿es una sorpresa que hablan español o que toman? Que los estudiantes toman clases de español aquí. Is that is, is it surprising to hear that there are Spanish that Spanish is being taught in schools here? Para mí sí es una sorpresa mm -hmm. porque he, he estado en algunos otros en algunos otros lugares a donde aún siendo hijos de salvadoreños no hablan español mm. y eso para nosotros sí es tremendo porque una base de comunicación en la lengua propia pues es, es más fácil mm -hmm. entonces sí me ha sorprendido yeah I am surprised because I've been in other places where I have met some children of Salvadorans that they don't speak Spanish so I think this is very important uh, for the people to learn uh, that language. Mm -hmm. Yes, in, in the United States, as you're probably aware, there's always a certain amount of tension between uh, assimil what we call assimilation, right? Learn for, for the children of Salvadoran parents to learn English and speak English is very, there's a very strong pressure here for that to happen. And at the same time, the parents and the grandparents and visitors from the native country would want the children to continue to speak in that language. And so that's always uh, kind of a push and a pull mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, podemos explicar que estamos hablando de esa tensión que existe aquí en, <clears throat> en Estados Unidos entre la asimilación, lo que dice, oh, necesitas aprender inglés lo sí. más rápido posible y usar inglés. Y la idea de que se necesita mantener eh, algo de la cultura sí. y, la, y la, el idioma es tan importante sí. para eso. Right? Um, your own impressions of, uh, of your visits to the classrooms. Yeah, so as I said, I, I always enjoy being with the students and the teachers and doing this type of exchanges. And, um, this morning and yesterday, we have uh, been sharing with the students from different levels, and they are very well informed about what's going on in other places, and also about the history of our country. So um, I really like that, and also I really appreciate the work that teachers have done in that, um, in that matter. Uh, so I, yeah, I'm happy, and I am very, like, 
I don't know, satisfied, mm -hmm. uh -huh, to have spend time with them and yeah, to learn what they know about El Salvador and share, and share our experiences in rural communities. Well, I have to tell you that as a former Spanish teacher myself for many, many years, I'm very pleased to hear that that is your impression. Estoy muy agradecido de, de oír que esa es su impresión de nuestros estudiantes, como yo era también un profe en, sí. uh, en, ese, en, en ese campo al, a, a, al mismo, o uh, con nosotros también. Um, so, I want to change subject a little bit and just ask you about the Sister Cities program from the Salvadoran perspective. So, I know that you are not uh, yourself a resident of Teocinte, or that's not, that your, your own role is much larger and covers uh, all of the programs, um, but just tell us from the Salvadoran perspective, sure. what is the importance of the Sister Cities program and what are your goals, what are the goals? Yeah, that's a very good question and even though I am not a resident of uh, Teocinte, but I, I do come from a community that has a sister city here in the United States, which is part of this network. Uh, I come from this town that is sister with the city of Chicago. And I was a scholarship uh, recipient of that program, so I can I can tell how important this type of relationship, sistering relationships, are for our communities, especially because this relationship started back in the late 80s, when we really need to have the solidarity support from international community to go back to our places of origins because people were displaced because of repression that we're um, experiencing from the armed forces. So this relationship makes a huge impact in the living of our communities, not only because of for the development of our communities, but also because of that accompaniment of the solidarity that we experience in this type of cultural exchanges and the realities. And um, I think <clears throat> something very important to point out is the, the, uh, the work that U.S. El Salvador Sister Cities does through the different chapters that we have, mm -hmm. uh, doing advocacy work for human rights defense in both countries, in El Salvador, in our small communities, and here in, in the cities where we have uh, our uh, sister in relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm wondering if we, if we, if you want to ask Lorena if she has thoughts about this too. Uh -huh. Este pregunta si usted tiene algún comentario sobre la importancia de tener estas relaciones de hermanamientos con las comunidades en El Salvador. ¿Cuáles son esas, um, esa importancia? ¿Cuál es el peso, la perspectiva de? Bueno, el peso y la perspectiva de tener esta esta relación es que bueno nos conecta en la solidaridad en la construcción de valores y en conocer eh, ambas culturas y saber que somos seres humanos que aunque tenemos una distancia nos sentimos tan cerca para ser acompañados y para crecer juntos. Mm -hmm. um, so it connects us uh, in solidarity and we also share the same moral values and even though we are far away uh, geographically, but we are together, we do have that accompaniment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that that idea of connection, la conexión, mm -hmm. uh, sobre distancia, over distance, is clearly a big part of this program, but also an important part of our humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, la humanidad. La humanidad. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, depende de esa conexión. Sí. Right, depends on that kind of connection. Um, so let me ask you because uh, again, this is an opportunity. Es una oportunidad para nosotros que ustedes estén aquí, right? That you're here. So tell us a little bit about what we don't know about El Salvador. Like, how is life there at the moment? Um, how has your how have your lives been? Uh, up till this time, uh, and just give us a, uh, some more of a glimpse, un, una, una pequeña vista de cómo es la vida ahí y cómo ha sido la, han sido las vidas suyas. Mm -hmm. Bueno, eh, 
Hoy en día nosotros podemos decir que luego de transitar por un, por un camino que nos ha llevado a ir buscando espacios y a trabajar en comunidad, eh, el arte de todo esto ha sido la organización, el promover los derechos, de la, los derechos humanos, conocer de los derechos y saber que tenemos derechos y tenemos obligaciones también. Y, y esto permite que también el conocimiento sea oportuno Gracias. para que promovamos una cultura de paz, una cultura de diálogo, un trabajo en comunidad, que es así como, como hacer un, un, un esfuerzo mutuo ¿verdad? de intercambios también. Mm -hmm. So going through a path in which we have been working or doing community organizing, uh, we know that that has built what we have um, in, in our communities, looking for human rights uh, um, in our communities and also defending human rights. We know that we have rights, but also we have obligations. So it is important for us to raise awareness about the human rights uh, for our community and also raise awareness on uh, culture of peace, to create a culture of dialogue and to build community. Um, so thank you very much for, you're doing a great job, by the way, very difficult. Muy difícil lo que ella está haciendo, ¿verdad? Sí. Very good. But I'm also wondering whether you have to, something you can add as well from your own perspective. Yeah. Um, as, as a member of U.S. El Salvador Sister Cities, I can tell that um, going through that process and sharing the history to the new generations, it has been quite a challenge nowadays because, uh, because of different reasons. Um, Many of our community leaders have died or others have migrated to other places and that's why um, or, or young people have migra migrated from their own communities because they are looking for better conditions for themselves and for their families. So I think um, that it is a challenge for us right now to keep doing that work, to keep doing community organizing, especially when we have uh, the like right now in El Salvador we have a state of exception or a state, a state of emergency in which most of the target people is young people so it is very hard for us to keep doing the work of community organizing having young people involved in different activities in the community when they are scared of going to a meeting for example in a community and they are scared of being uh, or encounter mm -hmm. um, or run into a police officer, for mm -hmm. example, and they can be accused of being a gang member when they are not. Um, so that's a challenge for us mm -hmm. as a community um, organizers and community leaders. Yeah, I would certainly think so. I was reading recently about the situation in El Salvador, and I know part of that state of exception means, I think, that uh, a police officer could arrest somebody simply for being one of three people who are gathered mm -hmm. because any more than two people together in one place you you are subject to being arrested yeah and and that also depends on which part of the of of El Salvador you right. are for example if you are in a poor neighborhood of course you will be targeted as mm -hmm. a gang person um and but that is not happening in you know in the wealthy. nice <laughs> right in the wealthier areas yeah. yes um see sí, so uh, how uh, si puedo preguntar cómo es que ha, ha tenido un efecto en el trabajo suyo y qué efecto por lo general ha tenido la pandemia en 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 el salvador so i'm asking about uh what effect the pandemic has had uh, in El Salvador generally or on your work specifically? Bueno, la pandemia en El Salvador sí tuvo un efecto fuerte. Uno porque, bueno, nos sorprendió. Fue algo que no estábamos preparados y, y nadie sabía casi qué hacer, ¿verdad? En, hubieron muchos casos en que la gente estuvo encerrada en alberques y, y ahí, pero no nos 
no se percibía que eso también podría ser un contagio masivo, uh -huh. lo cual se dio también por eso. Y para el caso del trabajo nuestro también eh, tuvimos que, que paralizar ciertas actividades. Uh -huh. Sin embargo, siempre estuvimos apoyando a la gente porque le llevábamos lo que necesitaba, como eh, las mascarillas, medicamentos, buscar entre nosotros crear una red que permitiera llevar alimentos, por ejemplo, para sostenerse mientras estaban en esa situación. And I know that Zulma is going to uh, translate very well again, but I will just say that Lorena was describing how much stress the pandemic put on a social service organizations just like theirs uh, to provide the services and the, and the, and the, the masks and, uh, and everything else that was needed to ensure that people who had to stay where they were would still get food, etc. I probably missed something, though. No, you did great. <laughs> yeah. I thought I would, you know, spare you at least one. <laughs> but yes, I mean, can you speak as well to uh, how it affected your work? Yeah. Um, yeah, like I was saying, the, the, the fact of sharing historic memory to the new generations. We have lost many leaders in our communities. Now we don't have that experience or that voice to share, to be shared. Many of them, um, we lost them during the pandemic. In the same way here in, in uh, the different chapters that we have in the United States, we have lost great people. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we are very sorry and we, uh, we have to look for new, you know, to, to, for new ways mm -hmm. uh -huh, to work with, with uh, the people. And during the pandemic, uh, we didn't know, as Lorena was saying, we didn't know what to do. So we have to start thinking again how we were going to deal with that and how we were going to keep our accompaniment with the people. And uh, everyone was scared at that time to go out or to go keep doing the work. But we, but we were able to, to go and uh, provide the support to the communities. Yeah, well, I want to um, thank you both on behalf of a lot of the people that you served, I'm sure, because that was heroic work that you did. Que estoy agradeciéndoles a ustedes porque por la, el trabajo que hicieron durante la pandemia, porque uh, de veras ustedes eran héroes como nosotros aquí también tuvimos héroes. We had sí. heroes here as well. Uh, working again to help the rest of us stay safe, have what we need, etc. Um, such an uh, such a crazy time. So, aquí en Estados Unidos al momento estamos en un momento extraño con la pandemia porque sí. no se ha terminado, uh -huh. pero estamos comportándonos como si no hay. como si ya 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 fuera okay no hay. Um, so I'm just describing this peculiar moment here in the United States at, at this time where we are not done with the pandemic and yet we are desperately needing and wanting to reestablish uh, the normalcy of the lives that we had before that and how much we want that. And so I'm wondering, I want to ask you, what's this, what is the attitude about COVID in, uh, in El Salvador right now? ¿Cuál es la actitud de, uh, frente a, a COVID, a COVID en, en El Salvador al momento? Bueno, la actitud es que sí ha dejado temor, ¿verdad? Y aunque el Ministerio de Salud allá ya dijo que pueden andar, que es opcional andar con, con mascarilla o sin mascarilla, los que creemos en que la pandemia existe, mm. usamos mascarilla. Mm -hmm. Y tratamos de cuidar y de dar indicaciones que la gente siempre debe de tener el alcohol, gel, tiene, siempre tiene que tener las condiciones, cuidarse para protegerse y, y evitar que la pandemia siga expandiéndose. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, the attitude of the people is that, well, people uh, is scared about or for COVID and the Ministry of Health 
uh, said that now it's optional. It's uh, up to the people if they uh, want to wear face masks. Uh, but we keep telling people that we have to uh, keep doing all the, the sanitizing process, wearing face masks, and using the, or washing our hands as much as possible. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you uh, both uh, do uh, a, a lot of work um, to support your communities. Um, and you also can see a lot of the generosity uh, and the interest that people here uh, in your sister communities have. I hope that that fills you with hope, um, but I also know that your work is hard. Um, so I'm just wondering how optimistic do you feel or how do you feel about the next little while, the next year, the next five years, the next ten years, uh, as you consider those? So, do you want to uh, sí. translate for Lorena? Este, okay. Bueno, quisiera saber qué tan optimistas están eh, para los siguientes, eh, para el futuro, para los siguientes años. Sí, sí, pero con, con la idea de que ustedes están trabajando mucho y, y pueden ver lo, lo feo, lo, lo difícil y todo eso. Entonces, quiero saber si, si están optimistas o, o no y qué piensan, qué ¿Cómo piensan del, del futuro, del, del futuro de los próximos años, más o menos? En honor a la verdad, tenemos nosotros convicción porque hemos luchado toda la vida. ¿Verdad? Este, en mi caso, desde los 16 años he venido trabajando en la organización comunitaria. Mm. Y, y sí nos da temor que la democracia por la que tanto hemos trabajado pueda ser interrumpida, ¿verdad? Y que los derechos humanos tengan retroceso, que es como lo que más habíamos logrado avanzar en derechos humanos. Entonces, no deja de haber cierto, cierto temor. Uh -huh. Sin embargo, creemos que podemos seguir buscando el que la cultura de paz sea un sea el arte para seguir, uh -huh. ¿verdad? Los diálogos no pueden cerrarse, deben de ser los que nos permitan seguir avanzando y seguir caminando en esa cultura de paz. Uh -huh. So to honor the truth, I can tell that I, I feel um, positive because we have been fighting for many years. In my case, I've been fighting since I was 16 years old and we accomplished a lot. And even though right now we are scared or afraid that democracy can have uh, or can be interrupted because we have gone uh, backwards in terms of human rights, but we are positive that we are going to keep fighting and creating a culture of peace and having dialogues in order to, to create or build community and move forward. Well, did you want to add anything or? No, I think Lorena said what I had in mind. Like Salvadoran people had suffered a lot and we, I think we went through very, very hard processes during the, the civil war and even, even before and I think people's power no one can stop that. Well, I want to say that it has been an honor, truly, as well as a pleasure to talk with you and to get your insights into, um, into the work that you do, um, into, the, into your country, which is beautiful and always vulnerable, like all of us. Mm -hmm. We have to be strong and vigilant. And I know that you guys are right there on the front lines doing that work. So I wish you the best of luck with Muchísima that. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Quiero decirles muy buena suerte con lo, los esfuerzos que gracias. están, que, y para ti desde la, la edad de 16 años, mucho tiempo, y con to, todavía con fuerza, ¿verdad? Y con esperanza, espero. Sí, con esperanza. Well, Barry, thank you so much for, to both of you for being here. 
Thanks um, for having us, for inviting us. Yeah, and for having this very peculiar but lovely conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Gracias por gracias. esta oportunidad también. Thanks okay. for this opportunity. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I have been joined by Lorena Araujo and by Zulma Tobar um, from uh, our dear sister country of El Salvador uh, for this very special edition of Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan. We really appreciate their time and yours as well. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.